Hi, my name is Ida Thompson. I'm the Director of Advancement at Holy Comforter Episcopal School, and we're super excited to kick off our alumni speaker series today that we're entitling Welcome Back. So welcome back to Ansley Collins Browns, who's on our video here. And I wanted to let you know that Ansley Collins Browns attended Holy Comforter from 1984 to 1990, and she graduated from Leon High School in 1997. She's been working at NASA since 2001, supporting the International Space Station in various roles throughout her career. She now leads a team of engineers who ensure that the research equipment on the space station is working to enable astronauts to perform science experiments in orbit. How cool is that? Hi, Ansley, welcome back. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be with you guys. Hey, everyone. So I'm gonna share a presentation here. All right, you guys see my presentation? All right, so I'm super excited to be with you guys. Um, like Miss Ida said, I am from Tallahassee. I attended Holy Comforter many years before you guys, but I have been in been in your shoes and I finished in fifth grade, uh, went on to Leon High School. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience and my career and a little bit about what's going on the space station right now. So let's see, here's my path to NASA. So I started um, my interest in the space program when I was at Holy Comforter, just like you guys. In second grade, we had to study a famous American Let's see, did you guys do that project in second grade? A couple head shakes. So we had to read a, a biography of a famous American and I picked Neil Armstrong. And as part of that, we dressed up like that famous person. So uh, you can see me here dressed up like Neil Armstrong to go to school at Holy Comforter. And that's really what interested, got me interested in space and flying people in space. Um, in seventh grade, I went up to Huntsville, Alabama to space camp because I found out that there was a place where you could learn more about, about flying people in space. And that's where I learned that there were a whole bunch of other people and other kids my age that were interested in math and science and learning about space and had a great time there. But I had a lot of other interests when I was in school. I also was interested in theater and music. And I went to a small liberal arts school called Birmingham Southern College. So I left left Tallahassee after I graduated from Leon and moved to Birmingham. I got a degree there in math with a minor in physics, because again, I was interested in uh, math and science, uh, but I really wanted to work at NASA. I had never given up that dream. And as part of my senior year at, in college, we had to do a research project. And mine, I chose to study the history of the astronaut program, since that was something I had been interested in. And one of my professors knew some people here in Houston that worked at the Space Center and made, helped me make some connections. I came to Houston and, inter, and uh, interviewed people for my project, happened to make the comment that I was uh, gra graduating in May and wasn't sure what I was going to do. And they ended up putting me in touch with some people in the human resources department. And long story short, I got my job offer uh, that spring to come work at NASA and uh, moved out here that summer of 2001 and started. And uh, my parents came with me. Let's see, do your parents still take your first day of school picture? head nods, maybe raising hands. So uh, even when I graduated from college and moved to Texas, my parents took my first day at NASA picture and uh, have it there. So I first started, I really wanted to work in mission control, but my opportunity was in the email system. And, and it's one piece of advice that I'll give you guys. You just never know what might come up if you show interest in something and take a step and ask a question. So my opportunity to come to NASA was working with the email system in the IT department, but I really wanted to work in mission control and everyone knew that. And I was fortunate enough to have that opportunity. So a couple of years after I moved uh, here to Houston and started working at NASA, I had that opportunity to move over to mission control. And I became a flight controller for the International Space Station. My call sign was TOPO, that stands for Trajectory Operations and Planning Officer. So I was able to fly the space station, basically. Uh, TOPO is responsible for where the space station is in its orbit and where it's going and making sure that the other uh, spacecraft that come to it are, are know where it is and can get there. So I spent almost 10 years working in mission control and it was a wonderful experience and really uh, really fulfilling to know that this thing that had started for me when I was at Holy Comforter, just like you guys, um, I, I was able to bring that to fruition. Working with the International Space Station, that's the spacecraft we have orbiting the Earth right now. 
uh, with 10 people living on board uh, as of right, right now. Um, but because we, it's international, we work with people all over the world, other scientists and engineers and mathematicians to fly, fly astronauts safely in space. And as a part of that, I had the opportunity to travel all over the world. So I've been to Tokyo to meet with colleagues there. I got to go to Moscow in Russia. And more recently, I went to Canada. And that was really cool. I learned how to fly the space station's robotic arm. That's one of the things that uh, the Canadian Space Agency provides is the robotic arm on the space station. So that was a pretty cool experience. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about the space station. Have you guys heard of the space station before? Astronauts living up there? All right, cool. See a couple head nods. So this is what it looks like right now. This picture was taken a couple of years ago, but it's basically what it looks like. And it's gigantic. It's the size of a football field. This whole thing would fit on, uh, on a football field. So the solar arrays are just like solar arrays that you guys might see on top of uh, solar panels on houses um, that collect the sun's energy and power the space station. And then the astronauts live inside. The, the space station is about the size of a five bedroom house right now. So it's pretty big. And the astronauts have lots of room to, to move around and do their experiments and activities. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about those. So I mentioned 10 people on the space station. These are the 10 astronauts that live up there right now. Uh, we've got, again, cool thing, I and ISS, the International Space Station. We've got astronauts from all over the world, including Russia, several from the United States, one from Europe. Uh, so lots of a very diverse, and, and a Japanese astronaut as well, very diverse crew. And I've shown the pictures here and based on their they're sitting with their crew members that they launched to the space station with. So at the bottom, those two sets of three astronauts, they launched to the space station on a Russian rocket out of Kazakhstan. And the astronauts at the top, they launched from a, from the, actually from Florida, from Kennedy Space Center, just a few hours south of you guys on a SpaceX Dragon capsule. Um, and it just kind of depends on what their mission assignments end up like as to which, which spacecraft they fly on. Uh, but right now we've got 10, like I said, these 10 folks here, and three of them are kind of extra special. These three guys, including Frank Rubio, who's right here. Frank Rubio is an American astronaut. This is his first flight. He's been in space for 366 days. It's the longest single space flight for an American astronaut, which is pretty incredible. Can you guys imagine being uh, basically confined to a five bedroom house for a year? with just a few other people, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your family. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, typically the astronauts spend like four to six months on the space station, but these guys uh, just kind of based on the way that the missions worked out have been up there a year and they are coming home next week. So next week they'll get in their Russian capsule and they will depart the space station and land in Russia and get to see all their friends and family after being gone a year. So it's pretty incredible and they've done a lot of really fantastic research up there. So you might be wondering what's it like to sleep on the space station. Here's a picture of uh, one of our Japanese astronauts on the right demonstrating uh, his, basically his bedroom. We, they have very small rooms uh, for the adults in the room. They're about the size of a telephone booth. Um, so they, it sounds pretty small, but again in space, you know, there's no gravity. so. They float up a little bit. They have a little more space. And you can see here, again, Koichi Wakata is the astronaut demonstrating in this picture. He has a sleeping bag attached to the wall with some Velcro. And you see he has his arms out. Some of the astronauts like to sleep that way. Some like to zip into their into their sleeping bag. Um, but they get about a six, about an eight and a half hour sleep period when they're on the space station. And it's not like at summer camp, you know, you go to camp and they turn the light, counselors turn the lights off and tell you you have to be quiet. Um, it's not like that on the space station. They have about an eight and a half hour period that they can use uh, however they choose. Most of them say they probably sleep on the order of seven hours or so. Um, during the rest of their sleep period time, they can read a book. They can look outside the windows, of course, which provide beautiful views. They also, you can see he's got a laptop there so he can check email. It's also cool they have a telephone on the space station, basically a, a internet phone. So they can dial almost any number uh, in the world and call friends and family. They even call folks down here that work in mission control on things like their birthdays. So that's pretty cool when your phone rings and you pick it up and it's someone calling from space. 
On the left, there's a picture, uh, this was taken at Christmas several years ago, astronauts demonstrating how their bedrooms are kind of all around that, the, this particular module, and they like to celebrate, of course, just like we do. Um, another important thing for the astronauts on the space station is exercise. They exercise two hours every single day, and there's several different pieces of equipment on the space station they can use. Um, there's a treadmill picture here of ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. She's flown twice to the space station demonstrating the treadmill. And it's pretty much like a treadmill that you might, you might see in a gym here on the ground, um, except they have special harness that keeps them pulled down so they can run. Um, in the, on the, the top upper left picture, that's um, a picture of Sunny Williams. She is also a twice flown astronaut to the space station. She's demonstrating the stationary bicycle. Um, attached to the wall and you don't really need handles the way that we do on the ground because again there's no no gravity so she can lean back and do her bicycling. There's also a really cool device here on the lower left that as U.S. astronaut Chell Lindgren is demonstrating and it's called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. Um, it's really cool. They can do, it's basically a weight machine in space. So, you know, in space, I could lift a 200 pound dumbbell, um, cannot do that on the ground. So we use resistance in space since we don't have gravity um, to work our muscles. And if you think about like a rubber band and you pull the rubber band, you feel a little resistance. It's a similar concept, just more advanced for this particular uh, piece of equipment. But the astronauts can do pull ups, push ups, squats sit-ups, all sorts of different activities. And it's really important that they do that exercise two hours every day to maintain their muscle mass and prevent bone loss. That's one thing that flying people in space for long periods of time has demonstrated to us um, that astronauts will lose that muscle mass. And so, you know, our long-term goal, of course, is to send people to Mars. And in order to do that, that's a really long trip in space without gravity. So we have to find ways to help keep our astronauts healthy so that eventually when we do send people to Mars, when they get up, when they get to a, a gravity environment on the Martian surface, they're able to walk around. So exercise is really important and it's two hours, like I said, every single day. And that equipment is, uh, it's like I said, it's really good. One of the astronauts I talked to said that he actually came back stronger after his mission from all the exercise he did on the space station. Um, the other thing I'll point out here in the upper right corner, that's Sunny Williams on her first flight in 2007. Um, you know, astronauts, they're obviously doing very important research on the space station, but they like to have fun too. They're people just like us. And that year before her flight, she had actually qualified to run in the Boston Marathon. But it turned out that the marathon was going to be when she was on the space station. So it turned out that the, the, the marathon time, the actual time they were going to be running in Boston, was during some free time that she had. And so she ran 26.2 miles on the treadmill on the space station at the same time so she essentially ran the boston marathon in space and i i just think that's really really cool that she was able to kind of keep up that tradition hygiene of course so you know astronauts have to stay clean and brush their teeth you know just like just like we do on the ground so a couple of demonstrations here there's not really a sink or a faucet they have some water they can put into a towel to to take a little sponge bath um you see in the bottom the bottom right, Karen Nyberg, who flew several years ago demonstrating washing her hair. They use dry shampoo or shampoo that can evaporate. Um, and then, of course, always, uh, how do you go to the bathroom in space, right? That's the always the popular question. Um, the answer is you go to the bathroom the same way you do on the ground. The equipment's just a little bit different. And there's some pictures. And if you're interested in more details, I suggest uh, searching the Internet. There's lots of videos where astronauts have shown um, kind of how things work. And then research. So this is what I'm really involved in now that my career has led to, and that's research. That's why we send people to space and uh, invest in opportunities to learn more about not only how the human body works in space and how we can live safely for long periods of time up there, but also what can we do in space uh, that we can't do on the ground? What opportunities, you know, materials work differently, uh, different water works differently, liquids, fluids, when you're in space without gravity. Um, so there's all sorts of opportunities for research and advancement and technology development. And that's really what the space station's focused on now. So these pictures are showing some of our astronauts using different pieces of equipment that now my team manages. So um, as Ms. Ida said, 
I lead a team of engineers who help make sure that that research equipment is working on the space station so that when astronauts send their experiments to space, their lab equipment, it might be lab, lab equipment, kind of like you guys have in your science lab, um, maybe a little more advanced. Uh, so up at the top, you see Christina Cook. She's working in the life sciences glove box. So we're able to, it's a fully enclosed area where they can do experiments and have, have um, keep things from kind of floating around in the space station. Um, on the lower right, you see astronaut Scott Kelly growing some plants. So they do grow plants in space. And that was actually really cool. That particular experiment was a demonstration to, to see if it could work, but he talked about how incredible it was after many, many months on the space station, you know, not seeing any grass, any trees, anything outside to, to see that, that growing plant, that that was really cool. So that also leads us to future investigations to be able to grow plants that we can eat in space. And there's several investigations. One of the facilities that my team manages um, grows plants in space and they're getting ready to grow some tomato plants. So they will test out the, the capability and send some home but the astronauts probably will be very excited if there's some extra tomatoes that they could maybe throw on, uh, throw on a sandwich for lunch. And then on the left here, this is a picture of one of the freezers. So we have big freezers because we only launch spacecraft up and down to the space station a couple of times a year. So at the end of an experiment, the astronauts might need to freeze the samples so they can bring them home. And that's what that is. And of course, the amazing views, right? All the astronauts will say, looking out that when the big window in the upper right, you see Tracy Caldwell Dyson, an American astronaut that flew several years ago, looking out the big window, we call it the cupola. It's actually a collection of seven windows put together looking down at the earth. And uh, that's where all the astronauts will tell you they love to go spend their spare time is looking down at our beautiful planet. And these are some pictures that were taken from the space station um, in the top left, since I'm not there, I won't call out the questions, but um, I'll give you a minute to think about what that top left picture might be. You can tell it's a big river. This is actually a picture of the Nile River Delta. So this is the top of Africa. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And the cool thing about pictures at night is you can see where people are based on um, where where cities are, where the electric lights are, but also in the rural areas where there might be a people burning fires, you can see all that from space. This one down here, I suspect you guys recognize the great state of Florida, where you guys are and where I grew up. It fits all inside one, one view from the space station. And right here, this little notch here, that's where the Kennedy Space Center is, where the astronauts launch when they launch from um, the on the SpaceX Dragon capsule. And in this picture, uh, folks here in Texas might recognize, these are this is the city of Houston along the Gulf Coast. So it's the thing about the orbit of the space station, they're flying 250 miles above the Earth. They go around the world once every 90 minutes. So they can see a lot, they cover a lot of ground and it's really a, provides lots of beautiful views. And that also provides opportunities for scientific research, looking down at our Earth and comparing things as they change. So I will leave you um, this last picture, a picture of the space station again, um, Unfortunately, I was hoping to tell you when you could see the space station. Um, it's going to be a couple of weeks before it's flying over. But if you go to the website, spotthestation.nasa.gov, there are hundreds of cities. You can type in your city, but maybe you have friends or family that live in other parts of the country or world, and they can enter their cities and see when the space station is going to fly over. And it looks, I took this picture a couple of years ago. Um, the little dot, it looks like a little dot right there. That's actually the space station. Um, it flies in a straight line and it looks like a bright, one of the brightest lights in the sky. It doesn't twinkle like the stars and it doesn't have flashing lights. We are actually seeing the sunlight reflecting off those big solar arrays and the metal components. And it looks like, a, like I said, a bright white light flying a straight line across the sky. Um, Unfortunately, again, the way that the lighting works out, it's not going to fly over Tallahassee for a couple more weeks. So I can't tell, tell you exactly when, but maybe check next week or the week after and you'll see um, when you can see it flying over Tallahassee. So again, um, my dream of working at NASA started right where you guys are. And I absolutely recognize in fifth and sixth grade, that's hard to imagine. But the thing that I wanted to do, I was thinking about when I was in your shoes at Holy Comforter and... Uh, was able to make that happen coming to NASA. So I encourage you to dream big. You never know what's possible and don't be afraid to ask questions and share what you're interested in because that 
those two things really help get to me to where I am uh, here in Houston working for NASA. So Ms. Ida, I'm happy to take questions if you guys have them. That is wonderful. That is so cool. How proud are we that she is one of our alumni? Can we give her a big thank you with applause? Thank you. We we do have some questions for you and we'll have the um, students come up and thank you so much, but we'll come back with you and after the students have asked the questions. Thank you. Great. My name is Grayson Wester. I'm in fifth grade. When you think of your job, what emotion do you feel? As in, when you think of all you do for NASA, do you think, do you feel scared or happy or do you get a feeling, this feeling that you can't quite explain? Oh gosh, probably the last. Um, I love my job. I love working at NASA. And to me, you know, I, when I first came here, I really wanted to be a part of flying people in space and the technical aspect and figuring out the technical challenges. Um, but having worked for the space station for so long, the thing I'm the most proud of is that I work with people all around the world. Um, my, the engineers that work on my team work with different other NASA engineers across, uh, across NASA, which is across the country. We have centers um, from Florida to California and everywhere in between. So we work with people all around the country and all around the world um, to do something truly peaceful and to make the world a better place. And I have a lot of joy and satisfaction from that. That's a great question. Thank you. We'll have another student in a second. Ansley, if you um, discontinue the share, we could see you oh, uh, larger absolutely. on the screen. That'd be so great. Thank you so much. And here's our next student. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liliana Dragas. I'm in sixth grade. And my question is, what was the hardest part about working at Mission Control? Oh gosh, that is a good question. I'm, you see me looking off the camera. I'm looking at the Mission Control Center building right here um, when you ask that. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges. You're working with a lot of different people and everyone has their thing that's really important. And it turns out all of the things that we work on are important. So learning to work together as a team can be challenging when you have different priorities and everyone has different expectations. Um, that's challenging. I will also say, you know, the space station flies 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The first component was launched in November of 1998, and the first crew members started living on the space station in November of 2000. So I'm pretty sure most of you in the room were born after the year 2000. So you have never lived on planet Earth when the entire human population has been on Earth. We've always had at least two astronauts living and working in space. Um, and I say all that to say that means we have to support them 24-7, 365 days a year, all the way back since, since November of 2000. So another hard thing about working in mission control is learning to sleep shift and learning to work night hours and uh, sometimes being called in at odd hours. You know, I've I've had the phone ring at three o'clock in the morning before where something's happened and I need to come in and help that. So that's learning to have that kind of flexibility um, is, is certainly a challenge and something to learn. I will tell you, you guys may have heard this from other people, certainly that the technical challenges are, are, are hard for sure, but a lot of times it's how do we put all of the solutions together? The, the, it's more of the coming together as a team that can be really, really interesting challenge. Thank you. My name is David Sling. I'm in sixth grade. What are some requirements to go to space? Oh, that's a very good question. So the minimum requirements to be an astronaut, you have to have a bachelor, bachelor's degree in a technical field. So math, engineering, or science. Um, that's the base level, but of course, it's very competitive. So many astronauts have at least master's degrees, if not doctorates. Um, some of the astronauts come from the military, so they might be pilots or um, military officers. Um, so those are kind of the base requirements. Um, but I think, you know, talking about teamwork, learning how to work as a team is a big part. Being able to be a team player is a big part of getting selected to, to go to space. Um, and from a from a technical perspective, that that uh, pretty much you have to have an advanced degree in a technical field. Um, and then, like I said, we also select astronauts from the military. And then there's a lot of training. Once you get selected as an astronaut, um, 
there's a two-year training process where you get to the base level where you can be assigned to a mission. And then when, once you're assigned to a mission, that's another one to two years of training. And uh, so the astronauts sometimes have to wait several years before they get to fly in space. Thank you. Hi, my name is Isabella Robotham. I'm in fifth grade. And my question is, did you ever have doubt that a woman could work in science? Thank you. You know what? I did not. Um, I always knew that I wanted to, to do something with math and science. I, I was really intrigued by that. And I had seen other women do it before me. Um, Sally Ride was the first, at, first American woman to fly to space. And she flew to space in 1983, I believe. So that was actually before I got to Holy Comforter. Um, so I'm really lucky that I saw women before me um, go and, and pursue Oppor opportunities to work in the space program and in the space industry. Actually, the very first woman to fly in space, her name is Valentina Tereshkova. She is a Russian astronaut who flew in the 60s, the 1960s. Um, so I, I, I'm, very, I'm very lucky that I saw women doing what I wanted to do before me. And uh, I think I, I never had a doubt that I, could, that I could do that if I worked hard and if I asked, asked the right questions. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ansley. We want to say thank you again with our applause to you. You've been a wonderful inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm so glad to see you all there. Holy Comforter played a big, a, a big inspirational role in my life, and uh, I'm glad that it's continuing to provide that opportunity for all of you guys and other students to come after you. Thank you so very much. Bye guys, have a good day. Thank you. Bye.